Good afternoon. My name is Vanetta Lightfoot, and I am the Multicultural Affairs Operations Manager here at STCC. On behalf of the Office of Multicultural Affairs, I would like to welcome you here today and thank you for participating in the 2020-2021 Diversity Speaker and Performance Series. As we gather today in a special place to continue to learn together, it is important to acknowledge the traditional and sovereign land we stand on and the indigenous stewards past and present of this area. This calls us to continue to educate ourselves about our history and to respect the indigenous people that own and care for this land. Today's presentation will feature Claudia Foxtree, professional educator and social justice activist. She teaches course, courses and workshops on transforming curriculum and culturally responsive teaching practices. She also leads conversations on erasing Native American First Nations people. She gives voice to the indigenous experiences past and present and asks allies and co-conspirators to come on the journey with her. Her presentation features discussions on identity, culture, contributions, stereotypes, and historical inaccuracies. I am especially glad to have Claudia back with us as she was a former speaker back in 2016 to this series. So thank you so much for being here again with us. Now, before we begin, I would like to make a few announcements. If anyone is interested in attending STCC, please visit www.stcc.edu slash admissions for more information and important enrollment updates. This event will begin in webinar format, which means your video will be off and your audio will be muted during the presentation. If you have any comments, please feel free to put them in the chat. I will be monitoring them. Once Claudia's presentation is over, there will be a question and answer portion and you can use the chat feature or the question and answer box to ask any questions you may have. Now, without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Claudia Foxtree. Segue di Tunu Kena Atiano, Yerman Arwak, Dakadiri Claudia Foxtree, Dakadiri Takina Ru, Dakadiri Yuka Yukei Kwainia, Hundakum Deutsch Mutalai Sites, Koa Idaka Iaha. Greetings. My name is Claudia Foxtree, and I introduce myself in the language of my ancestors, at least two of them. First, Taino for my father, and then German for my mother. German is my first language, and I also introduce my tribal community. Guainia and my indigenous name, Takina Ru, which translates to woman who leads or teaches. This was a name I, I recently received in a naming ceremony. Um, I didn't have the opportunity to learn all about my culture as I was growing up in Massachusetts. And part of that is because the Native American Religious Freedom Act wasn't even passed till 1978, but my children did and they each received their names when they were younger in their own naming ceremonies. Um, I have Arawak indigenous ancestry. We're people from the Caribbean, uh, but now I live on the traditional unceded, unsurrendered Pataka territory of the Penacook, uh, now known as Bill Ricca, Massachusetts. Thank you, Vanetta, for your tribal land acknowledgement. This is an important first step in making visible what has been invisible, which is the caretakers and the original inhabitants and contributions of indigenous people. And that erasure is part of what I'm gonna be talking about today. I can't cover 500 years of um, missing information, missing history. I'm just gonna hit a couple of spots, make a few links between past and present, and hopefully offer some ways to be an ally as we move forward. I do have a slideshow and this will stop the other screen. Okay, just wanna make sure that I can uh, get to it safely and it looks like I can. So another thing I like to do besides um, starting with the tribal land acknowledgement, which we can start doing in the next time we're having a conversation, today, tomorrow, um, they don't have to be just before a presentation or a meeting. They can be part of how we have conversations. So 
in the last few years, I have traveled to places that were originally with the Choctaw and the Mound Builders. And while the Mound Builders are not there anymore, the Choctaw are, and you might know it as St. Louis. Or I went to where the Crow Reservation is, also known as Montana. Or even just saying, um, I now live in the place that we know as Massachusetts, and I went to school in the place that you know as Boston, the indigenous people called it Shamit. So just there are ways we can start to make visible indigenous people. And I'm gonna be talking about history, stereotypes, things like that, because that's my sphere of influence. That's where I have um, knowledge, ability, and my community. That's not to say that there aren't other serious issues going on across the country with indigenous people, including access to fresh water. I can turn off on my sink, either at work or at home, and have water for drinking, brushing my teeth, and Navajo Nation cannot do that. And they have to have water trucked in because of the US uranium mining. And so that and many other issues are existing among indigenous people in this country of the United States. And so if that's the area where you have your sphere of influence, that might be one of the things that you work on. Uh, for me, it's education. And in that vein, I have certain relative privileges that I like to acknowledge there are many, but a few of them that affect me here is that I'm college educated, that my parents were college educated, that I own my house. Well, the bank owns my house, but I own my house. And that um, I'm cisgender and I speak English fluently and I'm able-bodied right now. These all make certain things accessible to me that are not accessible to other people. And acknowledging and thinking about where we have that privilege is an important step to being an ally because we can use that to then help folks who don't have that access. So if you're not speaking English and you need something from a school system, you need to find someone who can translate or someone who speaks English. You know, we have roles, uh, some are bigger roles, some are smaller roles, but there are things that we can do as an ally uh, within our sphere of influence, our contact, our networks, et cetera. Uh, I wanna make a little note about language. The first thing that, about language is that there is no perfect word. You're gonna see me sit here, hear me say American Indian, Native American, First Nations, and um, other names as well, because there isn't a perfect word. They all have different kinds of problems. And in fact, this happened um, at the CNN poll a couple of weeks ago when we had the election. They said white, Latino, black, Asian, and something else. So it was funny to be called something else, say, instead of other. And it was telling that we don't really know what we're supposed to say there. So. I like to say indigenous people because that's what is in the legislation now, indigenous people's day and native American and American Indian have been around for a long time and the literature uses it and the case law uses it. I'm talking about the indigenous people of the Western hemisphere before 1492, but that will be the only time that I say that really long phrase. It is best to try to say the person, the group's name. So if we're talking about the pilgrims and we're usually talking about the Wampanoag, for example, if we're talking about um, the Navajo Nation, we'd say the Navajo Nation. And if we can do one better, which is say the nation's name, so the Navajo call themselves the Diné, and we say the word Wampanoag, the way the Wampanoag say, as opposed to the way the Massachusetts would say it, which is, um, for example, they would call Massasoit, Massasoit. So there are different accents, different pronunciations, and all we can do is the best we can do in that more moment and the more we learn, the better we can, the, the, the more we can do better. Um, so that piece of having growth, I wouldn't be an educator if I didn't feel like kids could learn, adults could learn, people could learn. You know, I talk with my seventh graders that they learn stuff in fourth grade, but hopefully they've learned a lot more now that they're seventh graders. As we're always learning and names are changing. And when groups get power, they also want to change their own way that they're called, their own names. And so we need to keep that in mind whenever we can. 
In terms of names, here are the original names of the Caribbean islands. You, um, when Columbus landed, he landed in Guanahani, which was the name that he used at, at the beginning. That word is um, parallel with, uh, or on the same line as um, Atlantic Ocean. And all of the islands had names. And then they were replaced with European names. And as it turns out, most indigenous people of North and South America speak a colonizer language as their first language. So English, Span Spanish, uh, French, Portuguese, and perhaps Dutch. Uh, so it's important to think of and remember that there were other names here and many people are relearning their language, perhaps as a complete language, perhaps as a language that they use for ceremony and personal identification. And part of that is because of the way that the United States was colonized and language and words were not encouraged for groups to keep. Uh, when I talk about indigenous, I'm talking about what this is America, right? So all of the continents of North and South America, not just the USA, which is just a small part of the Americas. And I'm not talking about indigenous people about the, over the rest of the world, although I recognize that indigenous people all over the rest of the world and indigenous people of the Americas have a solidarity in being indigenous people. For this presentation, I'm talking about North America and South America because of course, the political boundaries are not the boundaries that the original people had that were here. Those came after colonization and settler settling and wars and countries, et cetera. A lot of stuff was happening to create those boundaries. And indigenous people from South America moved into the North American region and Canada moved south and folks from what we know as the US moved to what we know as Canada. So there was a lot of overlap with where indigenous people um, lived, moved, hunted, and those sorts of things. Oh, and if you know whose land you're on, take this moment to write it in the chat. Um, it's always great to practice finding out um, the native indigenous people of your area. There is a great app, you can find it on the web or as a download called native land, one word, no S, dot C-A. And it's a good starting point. It's not the only place to find things about who the people are, local historians, libraries, that sort of thing, older maps. Uh, but it's a good starting point to acknowledge what land you're mostly on. So if you know it and can find it, please write it in the chat. Um, I wanted to just give a little bit of research. This was um, First Nations Developmental Development Institute. Their research team conducted 28 focus groups in 11 states. They surveyed over 13,000 people online, analyzed 4.9 million social media posts, and interviewed members of Congress, judges, philanthropists, business, and industry leaders. And here is just some of the data that they found. Representation of contemporary Native Americans was found to be almost completely absent from K-12 education, pop culture, news media, and politics. We're gonna hear, uh, as I go through the presentation, you're gonna hear why this is so critically important. This absence means that whatever we do know or do see is what gets stuck in our brains as what is Native American or what is indigenous because it's completely absent from all these other venues. And therefore the stereotypes, the myths, the misinformation, they become the only stories. 62% of US Native, non-Native Americans report not knowing a single one of the over 5 million Native people in the US. This is particularly true of the Northeast where there aren't any large reservations. If you live in a large reservation, you might not know anybody, but you know indigenous people exist. The number one thing that indigenous people face in terms of stereotypes is the idea, aren't they all dead? That we no longer exist, that either we're completely um, killed or completely uh, assimilated, neither of which is true, but certainly how um, government policies have spread that myth for their own benefit, nobody's here, I can take this. Over only 13% of state history curriculum standards about Native Americans cover events after the year 1900, 
even though this country operated over 400 Indian boarding schools, only four states teach the history, Arizona, Washington, Oklahoma, and Kansas. And that's just the boarding school. That's not even talking about the real history, all of the history of indigenous people. And media depiction of contemporary Native Americans so rare that according to a 2015 report, 95 of the first 100 Google images results for Native American are only historical because we don't see contemporary people. So we not only do, do people report not knowing anyone, they don't even have access to seeing anyone in contemporary depictions. So now what I'm gonna share are some um, disturbing f historical facts. There are um, resources and references and I gave some of them. I can give some more if, if someone specifically wants to know something but um, it's a lot of extra words on the slides and it's a lot of extra words to talk about. And I'm not, you're not even gonna get the whole stories. You're gonna get some headlines um, of, of history that you might not have known as I make some links here. We're gonna start with this um, early image. This is from 1505. It's one of the first images, it is the first image that came out of the Americas depicting the indigenous people. Now, uh, that was wood prints because it was newspapers. And so that's how you got the pictures on each page um, before the modern printing press. And you will notice here that it is the Caribbean because that was first contact and it has human bone, uh, body parts hanging around. So this is the image representing cannibalism or savagery um, or not being fully human, certainly not being Christian. And it is what got perpetuated around Europe about um, characterizing the indigenous people that were being greeted. This wasn't the first idea, but it was the image that got perpetuated. And while there might've been cannibalism, there was cannibalism among a lot of other groups as well, including the Donner Party, including the Essex whaling ship. So it might have happened, it isn't how indigenous people were and it wasn't how they were reported as being in Columbus's original first journals. This happened after contact in a deliberate attempt to make folks less human so that land could be taken, atrocities could be committed and the argument could be, well, they're really savages. It has perpetuated for 500 and 28, I think it is over 500 years now uh, that the people of the Caribbean are cannibals and savages. And in our founding documents, the idea of the merciless Indian savages that Britain was not protecting the colonists from show up again. In the um, Disney Pocahontas film, that's a cartoon, there's a song their skin's a hellish red, they're only good when dead, they're savages, savages, barely even human. So you might think that this is something that is um, a kid's show, it doesn't stick in people's head, but remember what I've already said, that in fact, there is no contemporary images, it isn't taught in K-12 curriculum, um, hardly anybody knows anybody who's indigenous, and so what they know is this, these are the little tidbits in a continuum, a huge history of indigenous people that actually get perpetuated and that people know about. And so when they have to pull up what is a native person, an indigenous person, those are the only stories that they have. And so it becomes highly problematic. Um, even the Boston Tea Party used this idea of indigenous people being savages. It wasn't indigenous people that dumped that tea. Why, why bother? It, I mean, it was, everybody knew it was the Sons of Liberty, but they dressed up because they had the idea, I can be wild, I can be savage, I can do something um, a little bit crazy because of that stereotype of how indigenous people were seen. So that gave them the courage or the fearlessness when in fact, we have real indigenous people who are warriors. And I put up Lori Pestawa, who is Hopi. And in 2003, during um, Operation Iraqi Freedom, she was the first Native American woman in US history to die in combat while fighting for the US military. This mountain below, or this peak, 
In 2008, Arizona rena renamed this peak. It's the second highest in Phoenix in her honor. It's now called Pastoa Peak. And I wanted to remind folks that indigenous people have fought in every war. And what we, you call savages, we call being warriors. We call defending the land. We fall, call being a, putting yourself between danger and your family and your way of build, being. And so being a warrior is something that is respected and admired. And if you go to a Native American powwow, the first dance will always be for the veterans and the warriors. So sometimes in what we all think of the military warrior uh, veterans and sometimes other jobs like being a police officer or a firefighter, you know, putting yourself between um, danger and the community. Of the nearly 2 million women enlisted in the US Armed Forces, 18,000 are American Indian women and it is disproportionately high. Just like every war, indigenous people have been a high percentage based on the percentage of indigenous people, which by the way is only 2% as of the last census in the United States. So imagine going from 100% of the population, the last time that it was predominantly people of color, by the way, you will often hear in 2050, we will have predominantly people of color for the first time in history, but that's not actually true. Indigenous people were here and it was 100% and now it's 2%. So if that's not genocide, I don't know what is, right? So of that 2%, we have higher rates of attendance in uh, military services. So dressing up for everything that I've already said is problematic. Masketry or mascots are not just the image, they are the dressing up, the songs, the acting out, the fake dances, et cetera, and the expressions that go along with it. Hey, Indians, get ready for the Trail of Tears. So mocking the history in a way to um, show, intimidate the other team, for example. So this is taking our, our idea of warriors because feathers are only earned for being a warrior like eagle feathers in particular, would be like taking um, military medals and ribbons and wearing them without actually having earned them. So it's problematic for the cultural aspect, it's problematic for the mockery, and when you have nowhere else in the entire world where you are represented, because this is where you're from, and it's the only images, it's really a problem. Every other group, however they came to this country, forced, not forced, um, voluntary, involuntary, refugee, there's another place in the world that has people like them. There's another place where people who look like them have their language, culture, history. Those are the foreign languages, by the way. So if we were talking about the languages here, we'd be talking about um, the uh, Cherokee language or the Diné language or the Wampanoag or Algonquin languages, but we don't. We, talk, we, we need to be at least saying world languages because foreign languages is everybody who came here afterwards language. And so not having another place in the entire world, this we as indigenous people and our allies need to make visible actual, real, authentic people, the truth of history, and dismantle the stereotypes, especially when they become the only thing that we know. So implicit bias research, implicit bias research is done by um, putting words and images together and it measures your speed of association. So how fast do you associate good things with Native Americans and bad things with Native Americans? And it's um, been perfected, you could say, from the Harvard University. They have the Harvard Implicit Bias Test, which is easy to find online if you want to be part of their study and do the re results. They have many, many different things. And other groups besides race and racism and Native Americans, their sizeism, you know, lots of different categories you could do implicit bias tests for yourself on. The, these tests were not done through Harvard, but they used the same ideas. And what was found was that people who lived with Native American mascot in their city are more likely to think of Native Americans as warlike. 
back to that savage stereotype where the residents of Cleveland were more likely to associate Native Americans with those traits than the residents of Detroit and Miami. So the more offensive the mascot, the greater the effect. And for the indigenous people living in those areas, the stereotypes make them feel like they're gonna have future prejudicial treatment. So they would react in particular ways, maybe present themselves um, as in particular ways or dress in certain ways as an interview or be fearful in a situation perhaps with the police because um, of the stereotypes that are being enacted. So why, in general, why are stereotypes so damaging? They make one story the only story, the narrative that everyone learns. They affect all children, not just the indigenous children. And they show indigenous and non-indigenous what folks look like, act like, do, and how to treat them. And they don't focus on actual First Nations contributions, role models, and resistance. I like to put this slide in because I think it's important to remember that racism, which uh, I use David Wellman's definition, a system of advantage based on race, because you can substitute all the other isms, a system of advantage based on sex is sexism. Um, ableism, a system of advantage based on ability, works as a system. It works at the personal level, the sociocultural level, and the institution level. It isn't just one big shark. It isn't just one mean person or organization like the KKK. It, if that was the case, it would just be in the personal level. But it isn't just individual acts of meanness. It's cultural reinforcement, social norms reinforcement, and institutions like educational systems reinforcing that. So racism is not the shark. It is the water. That's Resme McKenna's um, description that he puts out in my, my grandmother's hands. Racism is the water that we're all swimming in and don't necessarily re realize it because we're afraid of the shark, but it's the water. And when we think of black history, we think of slavery and we know that there's been a horrible history of stealing people and from their land and their culture. When we think of Jewish folks, we think of the Holocaust, or maybe we think of Egypt and the Exodus, and we know that there's been a horrible history. But when we think of indigenous people, we don't think of that because we haven't learned that in the United States. We don't think of the horrible, atrocious history. And so we might think of, in the only contemporary thing that we ever hear about, the casino Indian, which is a new stereotype. And it is one of the only places we now get any 20th century images instead of them being all dead or in the 19th century. And the casino Indian stereotype has its own problems. The top image here is the Mashantucket Pequot in Connecticut. It is the second largest casino in the world. It is a big casino. It makes a lot of money. And it is rare among casinos and among indigenous people. Most look like the Ho-Chunk Casino and many are on land that is not easily accessible by highways because it was reservations and that's where people were put to get away from the um, populations. And so they're not in actively traveled areas. They don't make a lot of money. Um, and in fact, many casinos don't make a lot of profit. The primary benefit is employment. So um, let's think about that. Casinos typically have 25% um, of their employment as indigenous people. And the other 75% is non-indigenous people from working in the casinos to owning the bank loans. And when we look at casinos as a whole, 75% uh, of the casinos in the country are owned by non-indigenous people and only 25% are owned by indigenous people. So even that stereotype isn't the predominant um, group who's owning the casinos, but it is the one that gets attached to indigenous people. And in some, some um, scholars see this as just another example of that savage warrior-like stereotype because it is a threat to the e economy. Right? So it's not the going to war, it's the they're, they're dangerous and warlike and fighting us for that chunk of the economy that's the casino that should come to us, which is already owned by 25% of us. So, I mean, 75%. So white folks own 75%, but are not seen as casino owning white folks. And that they are the ones that feel threatened when there's casinos. 
So indigenous people have sovereign rights on their own land to be able to do what they need to do for survival, sovereignty, and to create income for their people. Often it goes into the infrastructure, but like I said, most people, it's just a place to work. Um, here's, um, there's a couple of massacres that most fo folks don't know about that I want to say because I got you for an hour, so I'm going to pour some stuff in. One is the Sand Creek Massacre. You can read a quote there directly from someone who um, saw it. I want to point out that this cavalry colonel was John Shivington, and he, he and his cavalry mutilated between 70 and 500. So the fact that we don't know the numbers might be inaccurate counting, but it also might be indigenous people themselves because they tend to take the bodies of their own away from the destruction right afterwards for proper burial. And so you can't always get accurate numbers. I know that's what happened at the Battle of Little Bighorn. So I assume that it might've happened at other places as well. Shivington actually resigned from military and aborted his political career after this. Uh, Black Kettle survived. He was an indigenous leader. And following this, indigenous people were moved to a reservation in what was being called um, the Indian Territory. This conflict arose because there was the Fort Laramie Treaty. Another thing we don't really learn is about treaties. And that was fighting for the land in the plains. And it became really problematic when gold was found because everybody started traveling through land that was by treaty indigenous land. And so the, and again, a snapshot of the reason that these kinds of massacres happened because indigenous people are fighting for their culture and homeland, putting themselves between danger and their families and being massacred. Uh, the ghost dance is a movement. Many of the dancers wore this type of shirt. A lot of times I put in slides because there's other points I want to make. And here I want to make the point that um, the, the system of oppression, like working at those multiple levels that I pointed out, is about control over Native Americans, especially in the West, because of course, indigenous people at one point were given everything west of the Mississippi, and then it got smaller and smaller and smaller. And so it's been control over native people, and that has always been met with activism and resistance, which is what we call it when you're trying to take the land away. Historically, it might be called wars, but that isn't what indigenous people call it. So the ghost dance was, um, a dance to build up energy and community in resistance. Wounded Knee happened, this sort of flows together. Um, this is Sitting Bull at the beginning. He's a Hunk Papa Lakota leader, and he was a spiritual leader and a warrior. He became more of a spiritual leader later on. He had to get a pass, just like he needed a pass off of if you were black off of a plantation to go to another, leave the plantation, go to another plantation, you needed a pass to get off of reservations. And um, after some of the fighting, physical fighting was over, he joined Buffalo Bill's Wild West show and he toured around the world with his pass. And uh, what, he was shocked by the poverty that whites left some other whites in because that would never have happened in indigenous communities. And he eventually came back right around this time of the ghost dance movement. The authorities feared that he was going to join the ghost dance movement and lead more resistance. But we don't know what he was going to do because he was arrested and killed in police custody. Many indigenous people are killed in police custody, um, higher rates than many other populations in the United States. And most of us aren't aware of that or don't even think about that. I'm looking um, through my pages here. I had some notes, uh, but I can't find it right off the top of my head. Um, oh, here I got it. Uh, Native American youth are 30% more likely than whites to be referred to juvenile court. Native Americans are more likely to be killed by police than any other racial group. Uh, Native American men are incarcerated at four times the rate of white men. 
Native American women are incarcerated at six times the rate of white women. So when this ghost dance movement was happening, and this, the death of Sitting Bull happened December 15th. On December, let me just get the dates right. On December 29th, the US Cavalry came and interrupted a ghost dance movement a shot rang out, we don't know how it happened, and the cavalry then massacred 150, but the estimates are higher in, in Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee and through subsequent research, men, women, and children, shooting them point blank as they struggled in the snow. Um, so Wounded Knee, which is a little over 100 years ago, was one of the last um, battles that was happening where ind indigenous people were fighting. And you can see that the US casualties are much less. These all, all these massacres became opportunities to continue what the US policy has done all along, which is to kill indigenous people. Um, I wanna quickly mention a couple of other things that are in the House of Representatives in Massachusetts and they're related to statues and monuments and those kinds of things. This statue of um, the appeal to great spirit by Silas Dallin outside the Museum of Fine Arts and the other one, the end of the trail are about defeat and giving up. Notice the downward arrow and the no weapons in the great spirit. When in fact, we continue to do resistance. This is Robert Barrero, he is the leader of the United Confederation of Taino People, which I belong to, and is continues to work with the International Treaty Council. There's Wilma Mankiller, she's walked on, and she was the first Cherokee uh, female leader. And we have Wampanoag leaders, the tribal chairperson and the hereditary chief as well. So there are still folks who are in leadership positions in the indigenous community. We are not giving up but the Massachusetts flag would make you think otherwise. As you can see in this um, old version or the first version on the left and the most recent version on the right, the idea that we're giving up with both arrows facing down. This is in the Massachusetts State House right now to be changed. As you will notice, there is a sword above the current Massachusetts State flag, which represents um, Miles Standish's sword. And it says by the sword we seek liberty, but peace only under, uh, by the sword we seek peace, but peace only under liberty. And if we were to look at an extreme, what if it was an ax with a pilgrim, uh, we seek peace, but only under li liberty, you can see how that phrase doesn't seem as open and uh, something that indigenous people would appreciate. On the right is an alternative that has been proposed with a tree and an accurately proportioned indigenous man with the words peace and liberty for seven generations. Um, Hannah Dustin, there are two statues. One of her is of her in New Hampshire where the, this event took place. The other is in Haverhill where she was from. Uh, the important, there's a couple things I wanna say about this statue, there's a lot more to it. But it's again, problematic in statues. In her hand, she is holding scalps. She is kidnapped by indigenous people. And then she massacres the, let me see, it was six children and one woman. The statue is not put up at that time period. It's put up in 1874. This is around the time that the last resistance like the ghost dance movement is happening. So it is a way, statues were used as a way to put indigenous people in their place. Like we're gonna get you, look at the, look at the scalps and we're going to elevate people who have followed that protocol of getting rid of indigenous people. The one in Haverhill shows her kidnapping and the base and has her holding a hatchet and ax in the top. Um, the papal bulls were the first documents that came out in the 
uh, 1500s from the Pope saying, if you discover any land that does not have Christians, you have the right to own it. So that is the right of discovery, the doctrine of discovery. And it meant anybody who was there, not Christian, would have the right to occupancy, but not to discovery. And this is important because it has persisted and continued right up into the 20th century legal system, because even the U.S. Supreme Court bases their decisions on previous um, court rulings. And so this idea of doctrine of discovery has stayed for over 500 years. You indigenous people have the right to be here, but not the right to anything on the property or the property itself, because we, were, we discovered it. Even Meriwether Lewis of Lewis and Clark fame went across the country with a branding eye and branding trees to say, I discovered this. But let me just be clear. Discovery was never, this is kind of interesting. Oh, look at that. I'm going to do some sketches. I'm going to make some notes. I'm going to go back. It was never that. So discovery is like the nice word for saying um, another thing, like colonizing or conqu conquest without war. You know, discovery is not really what it was, but that is what the, it's called. I have this image of Christopher Columbus. Um, again, this is painted um, later. And I, when I'm with um, folks, I like to say, can you name anybody in this picture? And frequently they can name that it is Columbus and they can name the ships, but they cannot name the indigenous people. They can't give me a name of the nation they can't give me a name of an indigenous person. What does it say if in a country that talks about this being the discoverer, et cetera, we can name ships, but we cannot even name the people who were the Arawak, the Taino, the Lucano, and the Carib, just for a few of the names. Um, when we talk about Thanksgiving, the question we need to ask is, when was the first Thanksgiving? There are some children's books that talk about Thanksgiving because it is an ancient concept for indigenous people that's happened here for thousands of years. When Europeans did Thanksgiving, it was always religious. It was connected to thanks be to God. Those were the Thanksgiving. So you can think of Thanksgiving as prayer, like that word um, could be substituted for it. And so for indigenous people happen every day, all the time. And for Europeans, it was a time that was prayer and would never have been done with what they called heathens or savages. So this image again is problematic. This couldn't be a Thanksgiving because it has indigenous people and Europeans together. But this is the image that we get. Again, it's a primary source, but not of 1621. It's a primary source like those statues of a time period, the 1900s, for example. And if you look at it, you can see some several problematic things. The main one that I wanna point out is that the it looks like the Europeans are serving the indigenous people when of course that wasn't the case. Half survived the first um, winter, Squanto to Squantum came, taught them how to plant and taught them everything they knew. And even when Massasoit came with 90 men on this particular day that's immortalized inaccurately, there wasn't enough food. So they went out and shot five deer and brought in some turkeys. And so if anything, it would be the reverse in terms of serving food and teaching how to plant and teaching about the different foods. Um, I know that I'm done with my time and I promised you some question and answers. So I'm just gonna do this quickly because I also wanna give you some ways you can interrupt the stereotypes because it just makes sense that if we have stereotypes, we need to get rid of them. How do we get rid of them? Well, the first thing we do is realize we have them and put in an intervention. This orchestra realized that they weren't, inter, um, they weren't hiring women orchestra players. So they did a blind audition behind a curtain with a rug so you couldn't hear the footsteps or with bare feet, socked feet. And then they increased to 50%. So the first strategy is realize you have it, make a plan and do something to stop the stereotype from coming up or the implicit bias. The second is make real connections with real people. When you can think of real people and um, remember them as the stereotypes are coming up, then it is less likely that you're going to uh, implement the implicit bias because you have real life relationships and they change your brain chemistry. They change your limbic system. You can learn by reading and watching, but forming relationships is the 
prime way you're going to prime that limbic system with new associations. So instead of warriors and savages, you have the people you actually know. And the third strategy is to uh, amplify the counter stereotypes and create new narratives. So where Peter Pan, Disney has these images, get the real images of dancers and drummers and singers. Uh, we're gonna do a quick one of these now. I'm gonna reprogram your brain. I'm gonna say three words. I want you to come up with the image. Not out loud, just in your head. Winnebago, Pontiac, Sequoia. So when I said Winnebago, did you think of the people from the Great Lakes area, also known as the Ho-Chunk? Remember I showed you their casino? Or did you think of a huge recreational vehicle? When I said Pontiac, did you think of a car? Or did you think of this Ottawa leader who was a warrior and a resistance activist fighter fighting for the retention of his culture and land? And when I said Sequoia, did you think of a tree or a car? Or did you think of this Cherokee man who invented an alphabet, never being literate? He saw it work, and so he knew it could work. He invented it, making his entire nation literate in one generation, and it is still the alphabet that they use today. A little more undoing of stereotypes. Tons of contributions in the food area as well as the natural resources for indigenous people. CBS, corn bean squash, potatoes, tomatoes, most berries, most peppers, nuts, all these things are native in contribution, but they weren't just found in the woods. So let me start by saying, I have three slides about contributions. One is about language, that language itself, the word hurricane, hammock, and barbecue are Arawak, they are indigenous. The word Massachusetts is indigenous. So the language is a contribution as well as the things that these language, these words are. So the hammock. Um, pineapples are indigenous to the Caribbean. So is tapioca. It comes from cassava and, it, and um, it doesn't have an indigenous name, but cassava is indigenous. Nuts and berries. So some of these berries are the first of the season. You gobble them up. Some of them are the last of the seasons. During the Trail of the Tears, when the indigenous people were relocated, they no longer had access to their walnut trees and their chestnut trees, but they saw these new trees. The nuts are the thing at the end of the season that you pack up and you take home and it sustains you through the winter. So they were like, what are we gonna do? And then they saw a tree and they didn't know the name of it. So they called it pecan. And pecan means a tree who has a nut that we don't know the name of it. And when you think of the vegetables and the fruits that you um, might be serving in upcoming family events, remember that they weren't found just as they were. The strawberry was, but other ones weren't. Corn was a grass. It was engineered to be what we see as corn now. There might've been one or two types of potatoes, but the hundreds of varieties were engineered by the Inca in the mountains with terraced farming. So there was a lot of knowledge that went into the development of these plants. They weren't just found in the, in the woods. Some were, but not all of them and not most of them because farming and engineering and intellect was part of it. We were not savages in a barren wilderness stereotype. So why do we need this? This is the land where we live and the indigenous people were the first caretakers and we need to know that about them. We need to learn the truth about our history because we don't know what happened here and this is where we're living and it helps explain current and ongoing struggles, not just for indigenous people, but for everybody because we're destroying the land that's supposed to sustain us. So that brings me to three of how do we learn about contributions and present people and the natural world it, and have a reciprocal relationship where we take care of the environment so it can take care of us. And we don't know how to be allies. So we need to learn how by building relationships, by doing things on our own that are working at the public level or the, the uh, policy level. Um, and that's where I'm gonna stop sharing. And in the last few minutes, offer time for questions. Thank you for putting um, things in the chat. Thank you so much, Claudia. I think every time you've presented here, I've just continued to learn more. And it's one of those things for me that, you know, once you learn it, you can't, you can't unlearn it. 
um, and, and you're so right that we need to um, respect the land that we're on. And we also need to acknowledge, um, you know, the fact that we are here and there were people here before us and you can't, <laughs> you can't say you found something that someone was already there. So it's, it's, it's constantly learning to respect, um, you know, um, indigenous people and people in general, and also learning your history is so important. And it's every time I hear you speak, I, I just think about my time in school and all the things that I did not learn um, all the history that's been left out. Um, and as a parent now, um, I'm trying to make it a point of being sure that my kids know who they are, where they came from. Um, they learn about the history that is our, our country, whether it's the cheery side or the not so cheery side, the, the truth that they learn where they are, who they who they are and where they came from. And, and and they're not going to learn it in school. And I realized that. And I appreciate you being here to let us know that we need to continue learning, especially as an institution of higher education, that we need to continue to make sure that we're telling our students, you know, to do a little bit more research. Don't believe everything that you hear just as you've heard it. You need to definitely look into and really research. Even um, if 10 people from today's talk from who were here, talk to 10 other people, we've just doubled the number of people who know something. Maybe you remember the piece about um, what makes a warrior. Maybe you remember the piece about the contributions. Anything is more information about 20th century people than that is being taught in the media or the schools. I see two questions here. I want to make sure I get to those. So oh, they're kind of long, so definitely question, yeah. uh, tell me what they're about. What are ways allies can show solidarity and take action to support indigenous communities in Massachusetts now, especially with Thanksgiving this week? Are there alternative rituals to engage our children in or what they in or that we can do as family to take action towards healing, justice, and change? Well, um, because we live in Massachusetts and it is where this particular event is um, focused. There is a gathering every year at noon at Coles Hill in Plymouth, Massachusetts by the Massasoit statue. Um, this will be the 51st year. Why not 100 years? Because it started at the um, 350th uh, anniversary of the Pilgrim Wampanoag feast and they invited a uh, Wampanoag man to speak, Wampsuppa James, Frank James. And when they, he, they asked for his speech, they said they uninvited him. So there's no better way to get a speech read than to deny it that first year. So now it is read every year at the day of mourning or the day of remembrance and um, other indigenous things that are happening to indigenous people in the area and worldwide actually are shared as well. So my understanding is it is still in person this year with some guidelines. Um, it is UNAINE, U-N-A-I-N-E, that organizes it. They are the political indigenous organization. They also have on their site um, the Massachusetts Indigenous Agenda, which is the five bills that are in the state house, the state house. So you could call, write, attend a hearing, and testify about the mascots, the changing of the flag, um, changing to Indigenous Peoples Day in October. Um, oh, I can't remember all of them. One of them is about Indigenous education in schools. I'm missing something, but. Um, right. Feel free to send that to us. You there know, are ideas I'll, there. I'll, I'll make sure I get it out to the to the Caves community for sure. Um, I want to get to this last question before we close out. Um, do you have any suggestions for where to find more contemporary history and more accurate older history about Native Americans? I help create middle school science curriculum and are interested in finding more information about the deep understandings Indigenous people had and have about the environment, creating scientific solutions to human challenges, et cetera. That's from Isabel. So my favorite book of all time, if I were on a deserted island, I would take this book. I read it three times in the first six months that I had the book, is Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer. She is a PhD botanist 
and Indigenous women. And she combines the two just beautifully. It is beautifully written. I read it and then I listened to her read it and it was like a bedtime story. And it gives history and it makes connections for that reciprocity with the land, all the kinds of things you want in science. It is a perfect resource. If you are looking for just missing history, there's no perfect resources, no perfect anything. Um, you just need to have 10,000 hours or 10,000 books as uh, Max Malcolm Gladwell says, in order to even get close to filling in the missing information that we have. But I, I would say that Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz and Dina Gilio Whitaker both have, um, they have a couple books together, they have a couple books separately and all of them are great starter resources. And I would also add too, I mean, look, look at some um, TED Talks as well. There's a lot of great indigenous speakers um, doing TED Talks about um, what we can do um, as far as appreciating the land, um, more about, um, about the culture and the history. Um, so I would suggest, you know, just kind of looking in other places that you probably wouldn't normally look to find the information. Um, and I'm sure, um, look at the other institutions because I know, um, for instance, Bridgewater State just um, is wrapped up their um, Indigenous History Conference. Um, and so there's a lot of resources there. Um, that It was really, really wonderful. Um, I will send Vanetta my um, resource document, which is about 20 pages. It has uh, videos, it has educational links, it's not organized by nation or by history, it's more by topic, but you can just search on the page for something that you're looking for. Um, and I recommend if you want something not as overwhelming, do the 21 day challenge that's on the Massachusetts Center for Native American Awareness website. Um, it has like, do one of these five things, do one of these five things, you know, every day, something different. So I just want to again say thank you to Claudia Foxtree for being here and to really, you know, for scratching the surface on what we need to, to, to learn about Indigenous culture and history. And I want to thank you all for attending. Um, and I wish you all happy holidays and, and definitely look for those resources to come from me um, and from Claudia Foxtree. So thank you again for being here and have a great day. Bye-bye. Seneca Kakona, abundant. Blessings.